everyone, and welcome to Opportunities for Real Estate Investors. My name is Ginger Faith, and I'm here with my partner, Gary Masseri. We're here going to be talking today about how you can protect yourself when investing in real estate. So Gary, tell us a few ways that you have experienced over the years. Gary's been a builder for a number of years, and uh, very recently we've been working together doing the luxury market here in Silicon Valley. So Gary, tell us some ways that you feel is imperative for people to protect themselves when thinking about getting involved with real estate, particularly in redeveloping real estate. You know, all, all, uh, all investments, uh, Ginger, are risky. We know that, right? Uh, of course, it's risky when you go in the stock market. Um, but what I like about real estate and where I think you get a more secure investment is you have a, a solid security. You have a tangible asset that it's tied to. So as an example, when somebody invests in real estate, um, you know, they're going to get what? The same information and the same documentation that the banks offer them. So what does that mean? So if somebody invests in real estate, they literally become the bank. That means they get a promissory note of deed of tr trust with rights of foreclosure. Okay, that's very powerful. As well as to be a lost pay on the insurance policy. So let's talk a little bit about five really strong critical items, you know, that we could, um, you know, that we could uh, share with the listening audience as to what they should be focusing on and looking at when they evaluate these opportunities, whether they're risk or, or not risk or low risk or high risk, okay? So the first one I think and uh, we should talk about is how well do we know the market? And Ginger, you being a broker all these years, how do you determine what the as-is value versus the, you know, after repair value or the selling value of the property? What do you do to determine that to make sure that we have the right pricing in line? Yeah, that's that's very challenging, and you absolutely do need need to know your market. And uh, so, as we're in the Silicon Valley area, there are pockets, like in many areas, if you're going mm -hmm. to be buying and redeveloping. So you need to be narrowing down the way I have always put properties successfully as I go into as tight a radius as possible and get the homes that are the premium sellers that fly off the shelf, I like to say. When you see the days on market go two, three, four, five days and you see that they're beautiful luxury homes, what are their amenities? We also have a design team that is really connected to what what trends are helping homes to really move quickly. HGTV has been a powerhouse in moving the market. And really, if you get your homes very close to what HGTV tells you you, you should be selling your home for, it will do that. And so um, we pull a CMA, uh, a comparable market analysis is one of the first things we do. So we wanna see what are the low ranges in the neighborhood and what are the high ranges and what are the days on market when things are really, really moving quickly and what are those hot items? What are people buying? What are the sizzle features? What's the areas? What are those like? And by knowing your area, you can make really intelligent decisions on not only where you're buying it, but also at what level and how, how much you can sell it for. So the, the basis is like the, the after repair value or the ARV and the current value, what's the gap? And Gary, I know you have a few distinctions as well with that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're right because uh, you got to be careful that you don't overdevelop in the neighborhood, even though you may build the most beautiful home in the neighborhood. You know, if you build in a $1.3 million neighborhood and uh, you're trying to sell a home for $2 million, uh, you may find out that you're going to come up a little bit short. Mm -hmm. So we always want to be careful as to just exactly what improvements are required to make the anticipated profit that we're looking for, you know, in those neighborhoods. So our advice is that, you know, you find out uh, who the builders and developers are and how much their knowledge is in the neighborhood. And you do your own research work and ask for comps right off the MLS. You can also pull a preliminary title report. It'll give you all the sales, you know, in the last six months, sometimes in the last 12 months. So look at that as well. So those are some good tips. Determine are these, uh, as you, the people that you're, thinking about investing with, are they overdeveloping for the neighborhood? That's the number one concern uh, that I have. Um, second to, you know, uh, doing a good marketing comparable analysis 
Uh, you can always call your local broker and get what we call a broker price opinion. All right, so again, let me go over this. It's very important. Look at the uh, comparable market analysis, pull a preliminary title report or a property profile that gives you all the sales, and then get the third one is a broker price opinion. Now, what else can we, what's another way that we can make our investment safe or give you the information to make a decision on a safe investment? Well, what about the scope of work, Jerry? I mean, that's always important. What, you know, what are you going to do to a home? We just bought a home for, you know, 1,700 square feet, and we're going to add a 1,300 square feet. That's a lot of square footage to make it a 3,000 square foot home. Yeah. So tell us a little more about why scope of work is so critical in making a safe investment. Scope of work is critical. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about the uh, broker price opinion or oh, okay. the CMA is if you're brand new to this, hire an appraisal for oh, 300 yeah. bucks. We, we don't have to do that because our, yeah. our builder was an appraiser. We've been in the market for a long time. But if you're new to this, I would recommend that you hire an appraiser to see what the value is today um, if you're really serious about, about the value and needing to know the value. But as far as the scope of work, SOW, like we call it, is this is a critical thing. And if you have talented people with you, this is another thing I would highly recommend to get talented people who are contractors, who know the market, know the materials. Now, over the last three years here in the Bay Area, um, materials and labor has gone up exponentially because of the, the building boom and the low rates, low prices. So um, our contractor just said he bought a piece of redwood, one piece of redwood for $90 recently. So understand that uh, cost of, scope of work cost to build could vary you unless you act very, very strategically. And if you don't know what you're doing, find a team that does know what they're doing. So we're lucky because we have contractors who've been in the business for you know 40 years and they, they, they're currently on the pulse of what is happening. So for example, we were looking at this house that we're working on right now and we're just in the beginning phases, but the uh, architect had decided to put another 500 square feet using the back of the home going into the backyard. Well, the contractor was looking at the entire thing and we we're talking between ourselves and we noticed that in the front above uh, where the roof line is, there's an additional 400 square feet right in the front that already has a foundation. It's got some framing, it's got some trusses that we just have to be repositioned. Now, does it make sense to utilize this extra 400 square feet with no foundation? I mean, with, with a foundation, no foundation work needed, etc. Or does it make sense to use, to, to do 500 square feet in the back it's right from the scratch? It's not as easy as you think. You think mm -hmm. building on the front would make sense. However, uh, the architect who owned to, who did this beforehand already has had this through planning. So this might Set cost us, prevented us from doing that. Yeah. It might cost us another month or two in redoing the plans, which may not work out. So everything is very, very specific. And how can you save money without cutting corners? That's a critical thing. So have a team. We're really excited because our team is like that. Like, how can we deliver high, high end value, but not have to act, pay for high end when it's not necessary for structural integrity? Um, you know, do we have to pay forty thousand dollars for a chandelier, or can we find that same beautiful chandelier for two thousand dollars? You know, I like the two thousand dollar chandelier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any way you need to save money. Yeah. Yeah. It's like those budgeting are, in your own life, right? Yeah. How can you save money? Those are very good tips, Ginger. I appreciate that. And and that story was was excellent example. You know, there's other things that we look at too. I'll give you an example. Um, we have uh, vendor relationships because we build so many homes. And one of the relationships we have is that we go to the same supplier for appliances. Now we're looking at like, like a Wolf range a type or a uh, GE monogram or Viking. Those are all top of the line appliances. But here's a way you can, we can save us money. We can actually secure the appliance, put you know, maybe 30, 40% down, turn around and order the appliance, even though we don't need it for another three or four months, and lock in the prices now, and they'll deliver the appliances to you know, our vendor, and they'll store it for us until we need it. So we lock in the price up front, which is really cool. Another way we do it is we have a friend that actually has a sawmill, 
and we can buy lumber direct, you know, with, and, and beat prices even at the Home Depot. So there's a lot of ways that we could really keep our costs down when we know, you know, the scope of work and what needs to be done, as we've explained. Now, there's a third item here, too, that we want to talk about the scope of work is how about controlling cost? Once you have your scope of work set and we do the budget, you know, we know electrical 16,000, plumbing's 12,000, you know, and we, have, we have all the breakdown line item by line item by line item. How do you control that cost to bring it in on budget and bring it in on time? So I'm gonna let Ginger talk to us a little bit about what we do, you know, and we're not, uh, you know, we're not ringleaders with whips, you know. We're <laughs> not? No, 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 we're not ringleaders with whips, you know, but, but uh, our teams work with us. But um, Ginger, tell us a little bit about, you know, how do we get this thing to come in at cost? What do we have to do to control our crew to make sure they show up on time and work their full eight, nine hours a day and give us the work that we need? Well, that is another challenge in the Bay Area right now. Yeah. Uh, we're always being yeah. challenged with with good work because um, there demand there's so much because so there's so the demand is really high. So yeah. um, finding people that you trust that you've worked with before, and then mm -hmm. everything needs to be in writing. And they say good contracts result in good relationships. Mm -hmm. And so having good contracts, spelling out everything in the beginning, and having templates. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we're big on templates. Right, mm -hmm. so that we don't forget anything. There are literally thousands of details in building a house, and so and there's a syntax, there's an order of flow. Yeah, system. Right, right. So you don't put on the drywall and the sheetrock before you put in the electrical and the plumbing. For example, that would be the obvious, right? <laughs> that would be obvious. Yeah, but we've seen the strange, stranger things happen, right? Yeah. So, um, That's yeah. So there's an order and a syntax. Number one, working with professionals. So if you get a professional contractor in there and they know what they're doing, they will look at a place and they have Terminator glasses on their eyeballs where they can see x-ray vision of everything and how it's laid out immediately. And that is of super high value. Mm -hmm. So get an amazing team. Um, that will help you to control budget. You know, and, and then also intend, and make sure that the timelines are adhered to. Uh, checklists, we're big, big in checklists mm -hmm. and calendaring, checklists, scope of work, organized details. Because when you're in the middle of a project, uh, t time is really money. Exactly. <laughs> it's you know. really, really money. Yeah. <laughs> you really start understanding what that means when you're uh, when you're paying out hard money to your mm -hmm. your investors and, and and you know, even though uh, we invest in our own our own projects. Uh, we still don't want them to go overboard on timing because we want to get that thing on the market in top, top dollar shape as soon as possible. So Ginger's right. I mean, we have we have really great systems that we use. Um, and what's the best use? We don't want to pay somebody a high-end finishing carpenter that makes $65, $75 an hour, have him sweep the floors at night. So we'd rather pay somebody minimum wage to sweep the floors and keep this guy, you know, trimming our doing our trim work at the end. So mm -hmm. uh, it's it's all how you position yourself. And again, the systems that we use to control it. We actually, the next step is we write ironclad contracts. And in those contracts, they have to give us the timeline. Is it gonna be a week, two weeks, or three weeks? And we tell them, look, you know, we're not gonna push you to do it quicker and faster. Of course, we want you to do it quicker and faster, but we want quality work. We want committed timelines. But we want truth. We want actual timelines that you feel that you can do this in an eight, nine hour day, working six days a week. And uh, they tell us that. Now, we write the contract, whereas if they uh, don't meet that deadline, even though we allow them that, that allowance and some contingency in that contract, those contract dates, if they go over one day, we charge them a per diem interest rate. So that means they have to, we deduct that from the contract if they're over one day, two days, or three days. Now, we also offer them a bonus if they come in two, three, four days earlier to get it done. While still giving yes. us quality. Yes, quality. We always, <laughs> we're on the site, we inspect their work. Uh, you know, we're not there every day looking over their shoulders. Well, we're out there three times a day. And uh, Ginger's out there, three I'm out there. Not yeah, we, not a day, a week, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe you My wife would never will. see me, you know. So, uh, so it's very important to keep your budget on Again, keep your cost in line on budget. Another example, when the inspectors come out, everybody stops working to see what the, no, 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 no. You know, we meet with the inspectors, the contractor meets with the inspectors. 
our workers continue to work, okay? And we want to make sure that we work with the planning department to make sure that we understand what their pet thieves are, what are they looking for. So we know exactly when they come out what to expect. So we never want to flunk an inspection. That just wastes total time. You know, pay interest on that, you know, waste wasted dollars towards your crew. So you want to pass your inspection. So that's another way to do it. All right, so we write iron contracts and we give them bonuses and so forth. Now, that's the uh, that's probably the five main critical items about managing, you know, our budgets and also controlling the contracts. So we want to talk to you uh, about what we call a concept that we use to call for forced appreciation. Now, why do I want to explain this? Because most of the profit is made when we buy the property. That's the truth. If we control our costs, we have a good committed group, we're going to make money. So forced appreciation is simply taking 30% off of the, what we call ARV after repair value or the selling anticipated selling price. Those are all the same terms. We take 30% off. Never in the state of California, and I was born here, have we ever seen real estate drop below 30% in a 12 month period of time. It just doesn't happen. So as an example, COVID came along. We lost three months on the last property we just sold about three weeks ago. And uh, when we were building it, and but we were hedged against that because we bought the property so low. Here's a property we bought for $860,000, about $400,000 of rehab in it, and we sold it for a million eight. So just to give you an idea how that forced appreciation works, we take 30% off the top, we subtract the repair cost, and that's what we call our maximum allowable offer, our MAO, our maximum allowable offer. So we buy the properties right. Now, we have a whole, uh, what I call acquisitions department, and we have an uh, inner circle of realtors that work with builders like us and companies like us, and they bring us a constant flow of these properties, which is really, really critical to have and maintain a continued growth in our company. And that's why we're encouraging uh, people that want to invest in real estate to look at our company, making a high returns, better than market returns, uh, offering safe investments, and to learn more about how you can invest in private money and again, sleep at night and not worry about losing everything. Mm -hmm. So, Ginger, what do you think? You think we got it pretty well dialed in? Yeah, We're, yeah, well, yeah, thanks Gary. This is yeah. very interesting. And yeah. so hopefully this has helped you to understand the basics. We, we have more to uh, more to educate you about next week yeah, next about week this, mm -hmm. but uh, we're excited about our new project. It's uh, going well so far. We're mm -hmm. due to close in just a little bit over a week, but yeah. we're gathering up all the documentation. Our contractor's excited and we're excited. So uh, next week we'll continue our discussion about safe investments and how to make sure that you're protecting your wealth and growing it. So this is Ginger Faith from REI Fortunes with Gary Masseri, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Hey guys, and, and last minute thing here too. If you need to have a, count, a counseling session with us or a Q&A, ask some questions, always go to our website at reifortunes.com. Let me say that again, reifortunes.com. And right there, you can schedule appointments with Ginger or myself, and we'd be glad to give you as much time as you need to understand about how to invest safely, either with us or other investors. It doesn't matter. We're doing this for you. Um, be sure to make an appointment with us, okay? So we'll see you next week. Happy investing. Happy investing. Safe investing. Yep. <laughs>